to come and speak with us. Uh, at this time, uh, I'm going to have uh, LaBella Alvis uh, introduce our speaker. Thank you. So I will start by saying that y'all are in for such a treat tonight, and I was so excited to know that Jerry Beasley was going to be spending a couple of hours with us tonight. With that being said, I'm leaving halfway through the presentation because I can say my fiance of two weeks family planned a surprise birthday party for him tonight because it's his 60th birthday. And so Chip and I will be having to slip out, but I'm very sorry about that and I'm so happy that it's being recorded because it will be a treat. My first memories of Jerry Beasley were, were as a teenager, growing up around the corner from his house in the Rosemont Garden area of Montgomery. I was a very important person to Jerry at the time, for you see, I was his children's babysitter. <laughs> Jerry was Lieutenant Governor, winning two terms over multiple candidates in both the primary and general elections. I was initially very intimidated by this larger-than-life person, but was quickly won over by his warm, engaging personality. It was obvious to me that even then, he had an incredibly strong work ethic, a generous and giving nature, and was genuinely interested in other people. His favorite charities were and are numerous, including the American Cancer, the Heart Association, Alabama Shakespeare Festival, March of Dimes, where he was named Citizen of the Year, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and many, many others. Jerry was a strong, loyal Democrat, which made his friendship with my family most interesting. As any early Republican in Montgomery will confirm that my mom was the first Republican to admit to being so in the state of Alabama. However, part of that friendship was due to Jerry, who was very patiently respecting diverse and different views, while vigorously and tirelessly working for his favorite agendas, such as the Democratic Party. After losing the Democratic primary for governor in a field of 13 candidates in 1978, Jerry owed a million dollars. Needless to say, job opportunities with that debt were hard to come by. So he started his own one lawyer firm in 1979, which became one of the most premier plaintiff firms in the country, now known as Beasley, Allen, Crow, Methvin, Portis, and Miles PC. I would personally love to know what those lawyers who hesitated to take a chance on Jerry due to his debt think now of their missed opportunity. As Jerry retired that $1 million debt very early and has tried more than 30 cases that have had verdicts over $1 million and 15 over $10 million. His firm has been noted nationally for winning such awards as a $11.8 billion punitive damage award against ExxonMobil in 2003. He and his firm have also been recognized for leading consumer safety through product reform, such as forcing rollover protection to be added to tractors in the 1990s. By supporting a client in a trial who wanted to walk away from a multi-million dollar offer if it was conditioned on confidentiality. His public testimony of his faith in God led to his original intent of helping those who need it most. And he carries that mantra through to his employees. As recently as two years ago, he spent five straight weeks in St. Louis trying and winning the first tout case verdict. Extraordinary in itself, what sets Jerry apart is that he refused to leave his staff there on the weekends and come home for a weekend away from trial. Jerry's skills in front of a jury are obviously renowned. One case he tried in a rural county excited the jury to the extent that they gave him a standing ovation. 
not such a great feat after arousing passion of closing by a good plaintiff's lawyer. However, this particular jury stood and applauded vigorously after Jerry's four dire. I would not have wanted to go into an opening statement as the defense lawyer after watching that. However, I did have one opportunity to try a case with Jerry when our paths crossed again in 1986, two years after I started practicing law. This time, we were professional adversaries as I was charged with defending my first death case as lead attorney after Bib Allen, my senior partner, was pulled off at the last minute to try another case in another jurisdiction. You probably don't even remember this, but I will never forget that trial in detail in so many ways. However, the most important thing that I remember was not the many mistakes I made, which I tried quickly to forget, but how Jerry handled them in front of the judge and jury. For example, I opened the door to Jerry being able to prove that my client had insurance when I argued during closing that my client was just a small mom and pop local business. He stood up slowly without any drama and he said to Judge Gordon, almost with embarrassment, quote, Judge, I sure hate to interrupt this young lawyer, but I must respectfully voice my objection as she is on the very edge of injecting wealth into this case. Well, I was not just on the edge, I had really stepped off the cliff. But Jerry made his point with his gentle reminder and I was probably saved from a malpractice suit against me as well. It could have been the most humiliating moment of my young career and very detrimental to my client. But instead, it was a lesson I still remember every day of my law career and I have adopted when I'm dealing with young lawyers to this day. While I could go on about the many, many accomplishments and awards Jerry has won, since Jerry Beasley truly, truly exemplifies what this organization in accord is about, I would rather he have plenty of time to share his thoughts with you. So, Jerry. You really never want your next door neighbor to introduce you. <laughs> I'm sitting there sweating. You know, it's really good to have an opportunity to come and, and speak. I've really sort of slowed down a tad. I only work full time now. And uh, I get this question every day, regardless of where I am. I say, first of all, they say, How old are you? I tell them. I say, What in the world are you still working for? I say, Why don't you retire? And then to add, I guess a little bit of irony, my daughter, who's younger than about the same age as Mabella, is already retired. And I have folks say, well, how in the work of you to retire and you're still working? And here's why. I enjoy what I do. And I was asked by Jack to recount some of the things we've done as lawyers that have made a difference in the lives of a lot of people we made some significant changes in how corporate America operates. I enjoy going to the rotary clubs because I always usually have sort of a, uh, well, I'll give you a case in point. Twelve years ago in Montgomery, they would probably hug me in the court square. Two days ago, three days ago, they gave me the key to the city in Montgomery. I never have quite figured that out. I think Tom has something to do with it. But things have changed a great deal in, in, in the way things operate in, in the court system. I just want to tell you up front, real quickly, there's nothing like being broke, looking for a job, and getting rejected by everybody you send resumes out to. But I'm going to be candid. The person who really straightened me out and gave me a lecture was then Judge Frank. Johnson. Judge Johnson and I had gotten, I was a young guy, he was an older fellow. Anybody who knows him, you know what a great guy he was. 
I considered him sort of a mentor, so I went to him and just asked him this question. I said, Judge, I can't get a job. I'm in debt. I got children. I got a wife depending on me. And Bob James has offered me a very small job in state government just to help me out. What, what should I do? He said, Jerry, weren't you a lawyer at one time? I said, yes, sir. He said, let me give you some sound Western County advice. I said, all right, sir. He said, get your ass out of politics. <laughs> and, I and I never looked back. I had no regrets. I can always tell folks, in my political career, I was the worst politician that's ever tried to run anything in this state. But at the same time, for 32 days when I was acting governor, those 32 days were the best days the state of Alabama has ever had. <laughs> Why? I didn't do a doggone thing. <laughs> didn't hurt anybody. Didn't tax anybody. Didn't take the property away. Uh, Robert Baxter here, I'm going to tell this story since he's here. His dad and I were contemporaries, we were friends, but folks thought we were political. We were political enemies, but we were personal friends. And the public could never get it figured out whether I was Baxley or he was Beasley. That for the years we were in office, that was a constant problem. I'd go places and I'd get cussed out because the Attorney General was out there weighing trucks and I just had to defend him. And so finally, after I got out of politics and was practicing law in Montgomery, I was down at the Old Exchange Hotel getting a shoe shine. And this was right after Bill had been elected Lieutenant Governor. And they'd done a pay raise by a boy's vote. It wasn't very popular. This guy was about six foot three, about 230, looked like he'd been off a sawmill truck, walked in and looked at me. He stood there for a few minutes and kept staring. I knew something wasn't right. So he finally walked up and said, Mr. Baxley, I want to talk to you. He said, my family supported you every time you ran. We knew you back there in Houston County, supported you then. said, we've been with you every single time. We put the yard signs out, we put the bumper stickers on, even gave you money. He said, how in the world could you go up there and do what you did? He said, I'm going to tell you, Mr. Baxley, none of us are going to ever vote for you again. I looked at him and I said, fellow, I could care less. <laughs> <laughs> and I really, uh, I didn't care less. <laughs> but it still didn't get back to back. He still, every, every, every confrontation we had, he came out ahead of the game. I was asked, why I keep practicing law. I get that question quite often, and I mentioned a few minutes ago that I do it because I like what I do. But I, when I was asked to give some case accounts of some of the things that have really changed corporate America, I, I asked the lawyers in the firm today to, how about sending me a case that you think really had an effect on safety, on people generally, and I got immediately 17 responses real quickly. A lot of those cases I've been involved in. Some I had sort of forgotten about, but I made a list of them. And the, the tractor case is a prime example. We represented, in fact, Bill Allen was the lawyer for the defense. Kubota tractor. This gentleman was out at a farm pond, the tractor rolled over, he was pinned underneath, hot sun, July, he lay there dying for roughly three hours, ants all over him, a horrible sight when they finally found him. So the family, one of the sons worked for the Department of Agriculture, and he tried to get in touch with Kubota to report the roll, not looking for money, did not get any responses. No phone calls back, no letters returned. So he comes to see us. I never had a tractor roll of a case at that point. This was years ago, back in the 80s. So Greg Allen and I decided to look at the case and decide whether or not we'd take it. And we did take it. We had no idea where we were headed. So we started discovery. We took the deposition of a gentleman that we learned through a third party who had been a safety 
consultant for Kubota who had advised them to put ROPS protection, roll bars, and seat belts on the tractors. And so instead of taking his word or his company's recommendations, they did an economic survey study to see, to project out, if we don't do anything and we have to go through trials and settlements, it'll cost us X number of dollars. All this is in writing. And if we do the opposite, it'll cost us X number of dollars. And so what do we do? They formed this retrofit committee and the decision was, we'll just take the risk. And that's in writing, we will take the risk. So when this company contacted us and said, we have this information for you, we sort of took it with a grain of salt. We didn't know what we were getting. But when we saw the documents that they gave us, we realized that we need to take this guy's deposition. So we take this man, Jack Bland, and say, Mr. Bland, name, so forth, were, was there a retrofit committee formed by Kubota? Absolutely not. Were, weren't you chairman of that committee? I had the blank, and the, I'd be chairman if we didn't have a committee. We had the minutes of the meetings that the company had given us. And so we felt pretty confident at that point knew we were going to be okay, and we got the judge to issue an order directing that gentleman not only to have deposition testimony available, but to physically come to court. He thought Bill was going to protect him, or so he came. So I get a call, all due respect to Bill, great lawyer, great guy, good friend, tough adversary, honest as the day is long. He called me on Saturday. He said, Jerry, said, you and I have been friends. You're a young guy. I'm a little older, but I'm going to give you some advice. We're going to pay you $25,000 and settle this case. And they, they tell me if you don't take it, they're going to sue you for abuse of process or some fancy term. I said, Bill, we've gone too far. I didn't tell him that all these minutes. I said, we're going to see you Monday. So we meet, we start the trial. First witness, this fellow, Mr. Bland, give us your name. Where are you? The, so forth, we the whole question. Lied, lied, lied. Then we show him the minutes turned chalky white, and he, he almost passed out on the, on the sand. So we go through the next three days of trial. So we get to the courthouse that morning, and there's Bill and all these tough looking lawyers. I thought they were going to whip me. I didn't think they were going to settle the case. They looked pretty hostile. So I said, what do y'all want? He said, we're going to pay you some money. This was in the 80s now. You're talking about $10 million. That's a heck of a lot of money then. Ain't so much money. Back then, that was a lot of money. He told us 10 million on the table, but the conditions, and I think you mentioned this about conditions are not only confidentiality, but you return all of that stuff you stole from us. So I get the offer. I go upstairs, there's Miss Fiber with her eight children. I said, Miss Fiber, they made you a very good offer. I told her what it was, and this is the condition. She said, Jerry, didn't you know my husband? I said, well, yes, ma'am, I did. I said, uh, what do you think Derwood would have told you if he was sitting here and, and I was dead and know that it happened to me? I said, I don't know, Miss Biden, what would he say? He told him to keep the damn money. <laughs> I said, what? I had to pick Greg Allen off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I was shaking, honestly, <laughs> $10 million. I knew that she had a family. They were all college. All these kids had all gone to college, good folks. They didn't want that money. They really, they wanted the public to know what had happened to their husband and wife and father and husband. And they wanted that company to do something about it. So I went back downstairs and told Bill, I said, you better call the Japanese. I said, he ain't going to take your money. He said, you got to be kidding. I said, no, Miss Pye is a whole lot tougher than I am. <laughs> so a few minutes, and the judge told him, said, Bill, you fish to get your rear end kick. You better go settle this case. So he goes and calls him. A few minutes, he comes back, said, you got a deal. So in the front of the Montgomery Courthouse, this is before this fancy technology, we had blow-ups of all these exhibits, and we put them all out there, like in a half-moon shape. And, and told the news media that for some reason all the media came that day. So it became an international story. I want you to go to the website of 
Dr. Boulder, and here's what they said two months later. We now lead the industry in providing ROPS protection for our customers. <clears throat> Thanks to the spy list. If we had settled that case confidentially, they would have never known. The public would have never known. And whether they would have ever done what they claimed to do for the good of the public, don't know. That's it. I could go through, I don't know what, y'all stop me if you got any questions, by the way. I'm going to mention two automobile cases real quickly. One case was the Toyota case that we tried in Oklahoma. <clears throat> this was one where, again, the defense lawyers threatened us right before the trial on Saturday. They told us that we were committing malpractice and we were doing all this stuff. And said, if you don't dismiss it, we're going to be suing not only the, the clients, but y'all. This was a, a sudden acceleration case. I'm going to give you the facts real quickly. Two women riding down a, a, a limited access road, not an interstate, get to where they were going to turn off. All of a sudden, that vehicle, Toyota vehicle, at 65 to 70 miles an hour, all of a sudden goes up to 95 to 110. And out of control, they couldn't slow it down, couldn't stop it. They crash in, they, they get, you, when you get off that exit, there was a, another turn left and right in a, in a wall. They hit the wall and, and, and killed one and, and catastrophically injured the, the, the passenger. So we get into the case. And by that time, uh, the public was becoming aware of what was going on because of the police officer, a state trooper in California, had his wife and children in a Toyota vehicle off duty riding down an interstate. And all of a sudden, that car gets up to over 110 miles an hour. He can't stop it, can't slow it down. So the last communication out of that car came from his wife. She calls her sister and says, Mary, please pray for us. We're fixing to die. And, and minutes later, they were all killed in the car. The Los Angeles Times did what the what NHTSA should have done. They investigated it, and they found out that Toyota had a history of sudden accelerations. Ten years, Toyota knew hundreds of incidents every year on the record in, internally. Not one time did they notify NHTSA, the national group, and, and tell them we have a problem. What do they do? As a fellow working for NHTSA who happened to be investigating Toyota or something else, so they hire him. He becomes the wonder working for Toyota. Anything that went back and forth from the government to Toyota went through the wonder. The president of the company goes on television, this is before our trial, and they ask him the question, CEO of the company, have you had any sudden acceleration problems? Answer, no. Ten years of history. The wonder, and I won't use his name, he's from, I, for another reason I will not use his name. That very morning, he sends the CEO an email. Quote, we have got to quit lying to the government and the public, otherwise we are all going to jail. Pretty rough. What do you think they do with the wonder? Send him to a psychiatrist and say he's crazy. Keep him on the record, on the payroll. So we tried a case. I don't know we've ever tried a case in, in this part of Oklahoma. If you think Republicans are strong here, you can go to Oklahoma. <laughs> we were scared, slapped to death. We thought, when I saw that jury panel, we got 12 best we could get. And, and I, I, would, I had no idea that we had a chance for that jury. We had an insurance guy on the jury with the company, had a, an engineer on the, <coughs> on, the, on the actual 12. So we go through the trial. We had a woman, a lady on there that I, I was convinced she hated me. Because every time she looked at me, she was <laughs> So we tried the case two, two or three weeks. I've gotten how long. 
And we found out, we, we had stuff on, on that company that, that they really should have been in jail for what they had done, knowing what they were doing. So we tried on the compensatory, that back, you had bifurcation there. We tried the compensatory part first, and the jury came back with a $3 million verdict on, on compensatories for a death case. Not a lot. It was a win. I thought to myself, we're going to do okay in this penalty phase because of all this. They didn't let us get a lot of stuff in that would go toward penalty damages in Oklahoma. So before I could get in the car, I get a call from the lawyer who had threatened me for abuse of process. He said, Jerry, what would it, he didn't, I'm going to show you how dumb I am. He said, what would it take to settle the penalty phase? All of a sudden, I gave him my number. He said, okay. <laughs> so, we settled it confidentially, and I can't tell you how much it was, but it was a whole lot more than 10. <laughs> and so what happens after that? The judge there, a female judge, who was terrific in that courtroom, fair on both sides, tough, a husband actually came and watched the trial, and they had hired the premier defense lawyer from Oklahoma City to, I assume, be a local presence and have influence over that judge. And hey, one thing that happened during the trial that uh, kind of got my attention. He got up and very eloquently, every time he'd object, he would, he would put on a little show for the judge. And every single time, she blew with us. So the last time, he really got to him. He looked over at the jury. He looked over at the jury. He says, I can't understand it. The little lady in the back row doesn't like me. That judge, if, if Luke's would kill somebody, he'd be dead on the spot. <laughs> So anyway, when we get to the we don't we don't have the penalty phase. That judge had enjoyed the trial so much, she asked the lawyers to stay in and let the jury ask us questions. So I agree. Defense lawyers took off like rabbits. <laughs> so we start they started asking us questions. They were very much into it. They, they understood the complexity of the trial. And the lady I didn't like. She said, Mr. Beasley, I got a question for you. I said, okay. She said, why didn't you ask for more? <laughs> <laughs> I said, ma'am. She said, you didn't ask for enough. She said, if you'd gone to that penalty phase, she used to turn to Judge Johnson and said, we were going to burn their rear ends. <laughs> and this was a lady that I thought hated me. So that shows you, you know, sometimes you just, things work out. Ten years, a company gets away with murder. General Motors, good company. How many of you go to the sudden acceleration case? You know, Toyota. This, in this case, it's the ignition switch case. Defective ignition switch. And what happens? You can be riding down the highway, and all of a sudden, your car shuts down. Lose your power steering, the braking capacity, the steering, everything is, is frozen. This little girl over in Georgia, a, a nurse to be, Beth Melton, riding down the two-lane road, all of a sudden it shuts down, she crosses the center line, hits uh, an oncoming vehicle, and <coughs> kills her. The insurance company contacts her family and says we're going to sue them subrogation. So they go to a friend of ours in Georgia, Lance Cooper. Lance is a small firm, does plaintiff's work. We work with him on other stuff. They go to Lance and they say, uh, they're going to sue us. He said, Beth was a, a safe driver. He said, something happened. Something had to have happened. I heard across the center line. He said, would you look at our case? So you get, you get an engineer that we worked with in Florida. Very reputable, highly qualified, good guy. He comes in and, and, and says there's got to be a problem there. So we go to a, 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 a to a salvage yard, get a comparable vehicle, and, and pull the ignition switch. And we find out, sure enough, there's a problem. So I mentioned a while ago the, the consultant coming to us. We filed the lawsuit, and, and Lance, I actually filed it before we get into